Turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to share with you just a brief thought this morning. It's 11 o'clock and we'll have you out of here just shortly. But I want to give you a little bit of food to carry you through this week. And maybe for a lifetime. So let's see how the Holy Spirit wants to expound this. So 1 Corinthians 11. And I want to share with you just where I'm sort of at with this uh, scripture, and I believe it's the, the, the word for today, that what we're to delve into. So let's do that, and let's take this apart and feast from it, and give God the glory for His word, and while we are built up by this word. So 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 1, one verse of scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, and verse number 1. So uh, it's pretty easy to find. If you see Exodus, you're going the wrong way. So go the other way. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul says there's three people present. By the way, if you're a guest with us, we are absolutely thrilled you're here. How do we feel about our guests? We're glad you're here. Please keep uh, Miss Virginia Broom's daughter, Lori Broom, in your prayers. She is in the hospital still with some pretty serious complications. And also, Miss Thelma Glover's son uh, passed away today, this morning. And uh, he passed away in his sleep. They found him this morning. I think it's her oldest son. I don't know his name, but I just got the text. Please uh, be praying for that family. I don't know any details, but keep Miss Thelma. She sits right over here. Uh, in your prayers and that family. I don't know anything other than that. So be praying for them. But if you are a guest, we're absolutely glad you're with us today. And we, uh, we of course, want this to be a worthwhile experience for you. One scripture, Paul says, three people present in this verse. You be or be ye followers of me. That's two people. Even as I also follow Christ. Be followers of me as I am of Christ. Three entities present there. You, me, or you, myself and you, and Christ Almighty. So be ye followers of me. Three people present in this verse. Follow me as I follow Christ. Be an imitator of me even as I imitate Christ. You don't have to raise your hand because I'm not raising mine. How many of you want to follow Jesus but when it comes to people following you as you follow Jesus, you'd rather not. Because you know the real you, and you, you only teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. So you know the public or private letdowns you have in yourself. So why, oftentimes when I feel good, I may say, man, follow me as I follow Jesus. But rarely do I have the confidence to say and to pray that scripture. Follow me as I follow Jesus because I see the own letdowns and failures of my life. Of course, I don't want to reproduce those. Um, in, in growing in the Lord and serving Him and uh, going through good times and bad and hills and valleys, I've noticed something about people, namely people that attend church on Sunday or Christians in general. We have an excellent approach to worshiping and serving God. Most of you don't have any real big issue with outside exterior worship. For example, if I said, let's say hallelujah, this whole congregation would sing an anthem. But where we struggle is following, the following part. Following God, following Jesus, and namely following orders. Now, not orders from me or orders from you, but we are in a society that says, I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. And nobody is going to tell me what to do. So imagine being me, and instead of 36 years old, imagine I was 56 for a second, and agree or disagree that we are in a nation that says, I don't have to do what you tell me to do. Anybody. So everybody has their freedom and their liberties, and praise God we have those freedoms to disagree. But we're in a nation that just doesn't care about you know what you say or they say. It doesn't matter. I can kind of do what I want. So imagine being a pastor in a culture where people do what they want, when they want, how they want, where they want. I mean, I won't, I won't land my plane on this bridge. I'll just kind of skirt through it. They can just come in, do what they want to do, 
Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And if I want to leave, I can leave. Because there's no true covenant uh, spirit in America anymore. Biblical covenant. Now, Tony Valdez, who'll be here in a couple weeks, he pastors in Miami, Florida. He says, what is the hardest thing to, about the area you pastor in? I said, well, probably that we're a culture of comfort. I said, they just built a Margaritaville right by my church. So we have a culture of relax, take it easy, breathe. So we have a tourist mindset. Very difficult to have people commit when the spirit of the area is we only come for once a year, one time a week. See what I'm saying? So we're in that culture of dip in, get a little martini, relax, breathe, retire. And so in that culture, we're attempting, I say that um, delicately, we're attempting to raise up a fire-breathing church in a culture that says, hey, don't bother me unless you know the code to the gate. So that's where we are. I said, what about you, Tony? He said, well, it's bikinis, Lamborghinis, and martinis. Welcome to Miami. Come on, somebody. He said, the party doesn't start till 3 a.m. I'm in a culture where church starts at 11 because you can't start it at 10. They're still in the bed. They got at the club at 7 a.m. You going to help me or not? So he's in a culture saying, follow me as I follow Jesus. They're still asleep from the bar. So we just was talking about our cultural challenges. So, so um, I began to think for about the last five years. So no notes from right here. I want to give you what I feel can not only change where you are, but is a faith word and is a now word, if that's even biblical, and is something that can open your eyes perhaps to maybe what is stunning your own spiritual growth as I give you this right here. Probably the most simple thing God has ever showed me is this. Most of us know what this is. We know a little bit about how it works. But I'm going to show you spiritually what is absolutely killing the blessing of God in your life and murdering your destiny and the blueprint God has for you. If you're miserable, God don't get any glory out of you being miserable. Okay, so in this little game of football, there is myself that I will play in this moment the role as the quarterback. Now, I can't prove this, but a quarterback is a quarterback because he's not a fullback, meaning that he's only a quarter of what's called the backfield. So if I draw a line right here with my hand, this line is called the line of scrimmage. And you can't move across this line till the ball is snapped. So this, if either team moves before that, it is a penalty. And it's corrected and directed by officials who will move the ball against whomever the penalty is against. This is the line of scrimmage. So the quarterback will place, or the, the, the uh, ref will place the ball on the line of scrimmage. Then the quarterback, who's the quarterback because he needs 75% other people to make that play work, he's only a part of it. The second highest paid player in the NFL is a guy who's 400 pounds called the right guard or left tackle for I think it's the Patriots. Why? Because he protects one of the highest paid players in a Tom Brady figure, a quarterback. So the second highest paid player is the guy who protects the quarterback. In a church sense, it would be the prayer team. Those that protect the ball, protect the million dollar investment quarterback, they pray. You don't see them as being a stage figure. You see them as hidden, but they're praying for you and your church. Somebody says, well, I got saved and nobody prayed. Jesus prayed. Somebody was praying for you, and that's how you got right. Prayer. God heard a prayer. So this is the line of scrimmage. The quarterback will assemble a team, simple, in a huddle. This is where he will say and describe the play. Are you with me? He is going to describe. He's going to look at every guy, and he's going to say, here's what we're running. We're going to run a 10-yard slant. In this situation, he'll tell who it's going to. He will tell when the ball will be snapped. He will tell how to do it. 
And the moment he quotes the play, watch, the other team members are to know exactly what to do. Let's break this down now in the world of Christianity. You ready for this? Imagine if I came into the huddle, and let's use whoever your favorite quarterback may be, and he gives me the play, and I look at him and say, hey, I don't feel like running that play. Um, I don't like the way you carried the ball. Uh, I'm not going to be there this Sunday, uh, and it's Sunday morning. Can you take my spot? I'm not feeling too good right now. My tummy hurts. Eleven other men are going to look at him like, are you drunk? We're in the huddle. So news flash. Life is going on right now whether you're living it or not. The curtains have been pulled back and life is in action. Now the devil knows the moment you're going to run off stage because he's watched your whole life. He watched you get up and he knows where to get what point to get you to to get you to buckle. But if you can stand on stage in the light of God and get through the tough scenes and the tough parts, you can get to where God wants you to be. So the quarterback is going to quote the play. He's going to say, hey, we're running a 10 yard slant and he's going to say, ready, break. They're going to walk to the line. There's a man out here who's not 400 pounds. He's 204 pounds. He's uh, taller, tall as Nathaniel. He's muscular and he is going to do this. He is a receiver. He's called that magically because he is going to receive the ball. He is a wide, because he's not close, he's wide, far away from the center uh, nucleus of the play, the ball, the center himself and the quarterback and he is going to run around. What if he gets out there and he says, hey, hey, I don't remember what time church starts. They're going to gaze at him again like he drank more. Come on, somebody. Get off the weed. Help me preach this sermon. And they're going to snap the ball, whether it's a hut or hut, 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 hut. It, they call, can call an audible. Let's throw that one in there. But he is not to move his feet until he knows exactly he's in accordance with the play that the quarterback caught in the huddle. Are you still with me? So the moment they snap it, he is going to move. He, is, he knows exactly where the 10 mile mark is, 10 mile, 10 yard mark is. Then he is going to cut. When he cuts, guess what's going to be about 12 inches from his face? The ball. As he cuts, he will do like this to catch the ball. He already knows that somebody from church is going to offend him within one second. He's going to get his head knocked off. Come on, y'all. I'm preaching good. He's going to get hit. So if you're going to serve God, you're also going to not serve the devil. And by not serving the devil, he's going to hit you with everything you can imagine. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And the game is already won. All you've got to do is keep marching down the field. He will catch that ball. He's aware that he has opponents. He's aware that there'll be resistance. He doesn't care because he and 11 other men have one goal in mind. To win this game. One goal, 11 brothers, all of different color. He catches the ball. He begins to run. Now. This man who is right here has a job. He is to take the ball. He is to back up. He throws the ball. And it does something like this right here. And that's it. Immediately the whole sideline would think he just busted a rotator cuff or something. What is wrong with you? You threw this ball a thousand times this week at practice. You've done this so many times. Sometimes it's the quarterback's fault. Let me show you how this works. A leader in a company, a business, a school, a family, a church, you fill in the blank, it'll fit them all. A leader gets in a group, an organization, a company, a family, a business, a church, and you know what he does? 
He says, I'm a big roller. I'm a big baller. So, so he'll, he'll sit on top of the company or the church. I've seen pastors do this and kill their church where they've got to be appeased so much so the, the body could grow if the pastor would get off of his big rear end and do something. The body wants to grow, but the leader is too busy squashing. Help me preach, y'all. Come on now. He's sitting on it, see. He's become political now. He's doing his own thing. I got a golf six days a week. I need a brand new car. And I, I, I ain't got, I'm not going to have no problems. I'm the bishop. I'm going to preach, y'all, whether you want me. I'm the apostle. You're going to look at me. I, I demand respect. And he's going to squash. He's going to sit down on that body, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And he's going to throw a flop duck ball that nobody can catch and then he's going to blame the other people and now how this usually works 60% of you have been hurt by the quarterback you were wide open you were ready to catch the ball but he didn't throw it to you he kept the money come on y'all he lied he stole and what's wrong with most Christians is they, they put themselves out there they, they, I was ready I was available I was willing well, Pastor Eric I don't think you should buy that land tell me how many kids you feeding again I'm feeding four See, when you switch it around, it don't work the same way. Isn't that ironic? It's always the will of God when it benefits me. Isn't that crazy? That's a word from God. Well, of course it is. It benefits that person. <laughs> Sometimes it is the quarterback. And as honest as I can be with you, I don't know why people do that. Let me say it again. I don't know why you would do that. I don't know why you would know that you're going to stand before God for sitting on top of your family and not allowing them to grow spiritually. I have no clue as to why any leader of a company that has one goal would sit down on it and not let it grow because, well, it's, it's, I don't agree with it. Well, the quarterback and the receiver don't have to vote the same to catch the ball. Because the goal is not how they vote. and The goal is to get to that end zone. Still with me? He will throw it. Sometimes it is the leader. Not always. Check this out. The quarterback backs up. He's ready. He throws a dart. And standing over there is the wide receiver doing this. Oh, me? Oh, God, oh, God's called me? Oh, you want me to run? Oh, which way? The same way we just told you in this huddle. Amen. Come on. Let me ask you guys a question. In your line of employment, do you love or do you loathe working with people that you have to tell 17 times one thing? <laughs> See how quiet it just got? Watch. This is all growth is in one summation right here. Back up. You be where the ball is going. If you have to constantly be told where the ball is going, you're not praying enough. If you can't see a church growing that you attend, you've got more criticism than you do compassion. And when your criticism gets high, your compassion will get low, you'll start walking in pride, and pride comes before a every time. Every single time. Well, nothing's happening around here. Well, you hadn't been here in six weeks, you wouldn't know. Come on. How would you know? So the goal, watch, of the quarterback is to throw it and that receiver to what? Be where the ball is going. So that there is no momentum or motions. He does not even slow his feet. He catches it on the what? On the run so he can tuck it and continue to run. Every, everything you can see in this world is relatable in that metaphor. What if the receiver doesn't stand there filing his nails? What if he runs? Watch, come on, watch this happen. He runs, but he what? Instead of running right, he runs left. You ready? 
Now he runs into the guy next to him who's running the route that the quarterback told him to run. Do you see the confusion? And they get back in the huddle, and now what happens? No, man, you're supposed to run a 10 yard run. No, man, you. And when there's contention and debate, there's no goal reached. So what if he runs, he runs, he's fast, he's a tiger, he's a lion, he's a liger, he's a cheetah, he's running. But when he gets to the 10 yard line, well, I don't like the quarterback because he's black or white. I'm going to go the other way. And he goes this way. Watch this. Now he has a head on collision with his own teammate because he ran the wrong route. Quick question here. Has God ever told you to do something and you almost did it? but you got to a certain point in it and you went the way you felt was most comfortable for you. And you wonder why in six months you feel a contusion of the neck spiritually. Because you are getting a concussion spiritually because you are running the wrong route. Well, anyway. What if he does this? What if he begins to run... You ready? And he just kind of quits halfway. Never stop running. I coach boys football. So when they catch a pass, you know what they'll do, right? Especially the smaller they are. Look, they run the route, they catch it, here's what they do. Here's me on the sideline. No. Keep. Come on. Running. Just because you called it doesn't mean you're at the goal. That's right. Monday obedience that turns into Tuesday disobedience is still Wednesday disobedience. You've got to obey God. Look at me. On the most simple instructions He gives you. If God is going to fight on your behalf, You must obey God with the most simple instruction He gives you. If you want God to handle the big stuff, you must obey God in route through the small stuff so that God is permitted to handle the big stuff. Pastor, why? Because God will not bless disobedience so that you get to the point that you think you can act foolish and still get God's blessing. What if he just quits? My personal favorite. This is my personal favorite. Hut! You ready? He's got it. He drops it. And then he blames everybody else for dropping it. My uh, Jude, he's, you can clear your throat and correct Jude. He, he, he just, he's the kind of kid you can go. <clears throat> My oldest son, you said, Jaden, why did the dog use the restroom on the floor? The wall hit me. And the TV fell off the roof and hit me in the foot and I broke my leg. He will blame inanimate objects. Do you work with people this way? It won't crank. You won't use the key. It won't run. It's out of gas. Help me preach, y'all. This ain't working for me. You're not working for it. Can anything be accomplished through rebellion other than death? You know what Korah did? He said, we don't have to listen to Moses. He's not the only prophet here. And God opened up the earth and swallowed him and 250 of his church members. And they died. Simply because they said, we don't have to do this this way. Oh. Jamie Leviner has been sober 24 months in a few weeks. 
We threw him into a ministry called the men's ministry that he didn't have a clue about, barely saved. I threw him in there, told him a few things, and let him go. Waiting for him to crash and burn. He didn't know anything. Yesterday we had nine or ten men for men's breakfast. An incredible solid day. We ate, we talked about issues of life, we confessed faults one to another. And after it was over, I said, Jamie, I said, listen, don't overthink this. And never allow the numbers to get in your mind to buffet you. Don't ever let numbers mess with you. Well, I don't have enough, I have too little. Just obey God on the simplest terms and God will bless you. But most of our issues in life simply come, listen to me, through a failure of communication. I personally struggle, I do, I have to admit, I struggle with quarterbacks that will not tell me the play, but want you to catch the ball. At the same time, I struggle with catchers, receivers, who will refuse to catch the ball if thrown in their direction. I do struggle. I do struggle. Because let me ask you this. If, if the church wins, who else wins? Everybody. When the church of Jesus Christ is victorious, pol- politics will, will fall off the stove. When the church of Jesus Christ comes in unity from the huddle to the line of scrimmage and nobody is screaming, well, I want to play left guard. But they're playing the position God has put them in for that particular series. When that happens, I can assure you America changes. But what we have now is a team that is so divided and so contentious, we don't know which side of the field we're running to. Let me tell you the most thing I struggle with. It's fourth down and half an inch. It's Super Bowl 70 and Creative Church. We're on the goal line. Folks, we are an inch From scoring, there's three seconds left and Lindsay's at quarterback. Help me preach, y'all. Hair coming out the back of that helmet. Troy Palamalu. And she's there and she's about to snap the ball. And here's what's going to happen, folks. If we get a half an inch... We win this season and this trial. We don't just get over the hump. We get through the mundane issues that you're struggling with as an individual or that we're struggling with as a church, and we score. And listen, there's blessing and unity when the church wins. Because when the church wins, everybody wins. If we want women's rights or gay rights or transgender rights, if we fall at the feet of Jesus, nobody is hated. Everybody is loved. But there's no such things as rights without the right giver. He's the one that gives us the freedom of choice. Jesus Christ at His feet. There's equal ground. But you can't do it your way. You got to do it His way. Listen to me. Blame is the path to death. Adam blamed the woman. The woman blamed the snake. And he didn't have a leg to stand on. It's death. It's void. I want to ask you this. Are you communicating it right? Raise your hand if this applies to you. You've said it, and you've said it, and you've said it, till you're tired of saying it. Come on, raise your hand. I thought we had some human beings here. Figured that. Can I tell you what leaders do? They say it again. Amen. Yeah. 
I'll make a prediction right now. I'll make you a, I'll, 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 probably more of a promise than a prediction right now in this church. You put your hand out, we'll bet on it right now. Within two to five years, this church will explode with growth and nobody will know why. And I won't know why either. Because spiritually, we got two inches over that threshold. Nobody no longer walked in discouraged and depressed, waiting on Bryant to pop them up. <laughs> Nobody let David dance for them. Where trick that is, not King David. They, they dance themselves. I'm going to preach now. Nobody set arms folded wondering if they voted for Hillary or Trump. Wanted to cuss them for both. Nobody sat doing that. Nobody wondered where so they ain't been here in a while. They on vacation. They 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 doing this and that. That's normal. They'll come back. If they're fed in love, they'll be back. If not, they're not called here. We bless them as they go. Praise God. When we come in with one mindset that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that God Almighty is on the throne, that He is not, not sleeping or slumbering on our life, and we begin to worship like we did up here earlier, I will promise you there will come a day when you don't have to grow your business. Look at me. You don't have to get peace of mind on your own. You don't have to do all this work internally you're doing or you're trying to do, God will do it for you. Your job is to come from the huddle. Help me, Holy Spirit. Get in position, run the route, catch the ball, and be obedient to the goal. Let me explain to you the goal of the property you're sitting in right now. To win lost people to Jesus Christ, to establish an atmosphere of revival in this culture, to preach the truth unashamedly, to proclaim this truth. I don't care if they're gay, white, black, brown. This body Bible don't change. We don't hate anybody. Say amen. We don't hate anybody. But listen, we're going to preach that sin will carry you to hell, that salvation will take you to heaven, that Jesus is the only way. And our goal is simple. Love God. Love each other. Serve in this community. Don't sit on the team for 10 years and wonder where your place is. Amen. Follow me as I follow Christ. Here's how it works. Stand right there, face me, and follow me. All right? Here, run that way. Oh, well, what about, don't ask questions, run that way. I wish we were Forrest Gump spiritually. Run until God says quit. Pray until God says it's done. But we give up because we don't feel it. And I'm telling you, God said to me this morning in prayer, if my people would obey me just in the most simple thing, the most simple thing, if they would be obedient, I would open the doors. But you know what we're doing? We're complaining about the quarterback, the water boy, the texture of the football, what, what, how we voted. We're complaining. When really there's one goal. What would happen in this place if worship really rose to the Son of God and Jesus was exalted as the figurehead and the author and the finisher. Brother, you talk about a celebration of glory. You talk about celestial power and apostolic anointing that would flow in this room. All that junk you're dealing with would fall off you by the time this service is over. God would do the heavy lifting if you'd just get on the bench and press. God would do the work. But we're consumed with it. I ain't got time for that. You won't have any time if you don't put God first. He'll suck up all your time. Your truck will break down. I'm going to preach now. Your car, you'll get in a fender bender. Now you, you ain't got no car now. God will delay you if you deny Him. Whew. Did you know that if I quit praying, we'll go five or six weeks in this church and nobody will get saved? It's not because the sermon ain't got no spice on the chicken. It's because I'm not praying as much as I need to. God will turn the water off and you won't even know He'd been at the spigot. He'll turn your lights off. Come on, y'all. He'll spiritually cut, shut it down. So I want to challenge you today. In whatever field you're in, listen to me. Play the position God has you in. Amen. Men, boys, guys, 
And being a man is more than hair on your chest. You've got to say, God, I fear you and I want to raise my family in the house of God. A man whose wife is dragging him to church will soon be taking his family to hell. You can't let your wife carry the load spiritually. Well, Pastor Eric, I'm a man and I don't know how to pray. Ask your kid to pray. Kids can pray because they just pray from the heart. When one of my kids says, well, Daddy, I don't know what to say. You know what I say? Well, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you. And pretty soon, two times later, they don't need you to imitate anymore. They got it. Hallelujah for the Holy Ghost. They got it. I'm so grateful and thankful and, and honored by the grace of God. I feel just a stirring in my soul to tell you, whatever season you are in life, listen to me, listen, whatever season you are, play the position you're in. We've got women and men in this church that are 70 and 80 years old that serve in a food pantry feeding people half their age. Buddy, that's commitment. We did, a spray, we, we did a spray foam project and 30 or 40 people showed up on a Saturday. And man, we had this place cleaned up in two hours. Sometimes, sometimes it can be the leader. You've seen it, I've seen it. A person that's leading a business. Man, they're sitting on this whole thing. They won't let it move. They won't let it breathe. And sometimes it's the other party. How many, how many of you give grace to people who will pull the plow while other people are sitting in the plow? They'll pull that wagon. You know what I'm teaching my children? You may not be more talented than your co-conspirators, but you can outwork them. Amen. And I'm telling you, if you've got a skill and a gift in life, if you can throw, catch the ball, run the ball, run water on the field, you'll always have a job. You won't spend your life throwing money in the front door to sling it out the back door and living in debt. If you've got a skill from God, help me preach this, y'all, you'll always have a job. If you know how to cook, there's always a Waffle House. You don't have to be broke, abandoned, and poor. If you've got a skill, you can do something. It's not about who got most talent. It's about everybody's got opportunity. All those people had the same opportunity with different levels of talent, but one outworked the other and got the bigger blessing, though he had the less talent. And if you're willing to work with God, he'll work for you if you'll move in him Amen. pastor Eric I didn't catch the ball so what we all drop the ball are you willing to run it again though Amen. are you willing to do it again I'm working on a message right now I'm not, it's not fit to preach anywhere if I preach today you'd think I was talking about you and I'm not I'm working on a message called a revival of dirty hands you ever, you ever notice how when it's prophetic, people get pathetic? Well, the Spirit of God is showing me a rainbow. Do you have a job? Come on. Do you tithe before you get prophetic on me? You, yeah. you ever notice how that works? How many of you have been in this type of church? Praise the Lord, I tell you what a wonderful move of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like man, is this real life? How many of you are dealing with real issues? Raise your hand. A real devil. Look at me. I don't need the quarterback to be a plastic quarterback. I need my quarterback to be able to take a hit. I'm going to protect my quarterback, but I don't, I don't want a weak-willed quarterback. I don't feel good today. Let me throw this out there before I leave you alone. A revival of dirty hands. I tell you what, a change of community. Yeah. People who got dirty hands. I, I'll do it, Pastor. Well, we can't find nobody else to if you want to do it. No, I would love to do it. Y'all know whose idea of Faith Nights was? Mine. You know who spearheaded it? Me. You know who's prayed about it? I have. You know who wasn't here Wednesday? Me. Because my job was to do Mighty Men. I didn't think I'd have any boys. I had 10. Most from this trailer park. They played soccer. I cut grass all day. I was exhausted. I laid on the field while they played. Phil came out and Phil said, I think Bryant's about to wrap up. I heard Bryant preaching the whole time out there. I was on the field. He was in here just preaching. 
we had an incredible move of God Wednesday in this room. They came out there. I said, oh, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. I said, y'all get in a circle right here. Get on one knee and repeat after me. Father God, in Jesus' name, save me. I made them pray the sinner's prayer. I wasn't going to meet in my position and not score. So I didn't give a lesson. We played ball. We, we laughed. We cut up. But look at Pastor Jerry. I wasn't about to say, well, well, I, I want to go to faith nights because I, I like the way Bryant preaches. I, I'd rather not. I, how many times have we heard this one as leaders? Well, I just need to be in service. I, I, I can't handle that. I need the Word of God. I'm, I'm not as spiritual as I look like. Raise your hand if you don't need good preaching. Everybody in this room desires meat and milk and water and bread. Every one of us. Where's your role on this field? Where's your role? You ever seen God take one leader out? Or the devil take them out. And the church say, Oh God, what are we going to do now? And God raise up somebody else. Let me tell you what I do from time to time. I hesitate to really pull my quarterbacks to the side and say, Hey, listen. Uh, you need to get this right. You know why I hesitate? Well, what are we going to do if they leave the church? You know what that's called? F doubt. What I ought to do is have quarterly meetings with all leaders. Come on. You doing your job? You doing your job? Hallelujah. Pastor, you don't want to be hard. You better believe I don't. As in fact, I want to appear as the nicest guy in this room so we grow. But you can't grow without consistency. People showing up, doing what God's called them to do. Look, if you're debating whether you belong here, you won't stay. Because you're, you're, you, if you've been here a long time and you still want, you won't remain. You'll jump teams. You'll go play for the other team. Because there's no real commitment. I had a text message from a man who had a couple leave his church. And the message was from the woman. It was pages about how God's called her out to be a priest in the community. And she had the brains to end it with, love you very much, and put the husband's name first. Like he's got a pair of pants. Come on. Y'all, come on. So let me show you what I'm competing with. Christians in America walk out of this room, hear 39 sound bits of preaching from Facebook, develop their theology from people who are quote-unquote famous. I walk in here on Sunday and am pouring oil into the, the gears of your marriage and your family to, that's probably holding it together scripturally, you know? kind of golding and pushing you into the, into the slot God has designed for you. But we're developing our theology from online. Well, you know, I was, oh God, I was listening to Ron Carpenter the other day and he was talking about, well, when you get sick, call Ron Carpenter. Well, Pastor, I, I tell you, Stephen Furtick, well, praise God, listen to me, listen to me. Don't forsake the local body for what you see on a screen somewhere that you're disconnected from, you don't have any connection to. Look at, look at Pastor Eric. This thing is a business for people. This is a business in America. It's a real estate company, y'all. But folks, this thing I'm preaching to you, Paul said, follow me with a knot in his throat. Because he knew if they followed him, they was going to follow through highs and lows. Come on. But whoever's left here in a few years, that'll be who your sheep are. Right. That'll be who your sheep are, see. 
Paul had a lump in his throat when he said, Follow me as I follow Christ. I bet he turned and went like this. Oh God, if they last. Paul, where are we going next? Well, we're getting on a boat and we're going through a shipwreck. <laughs> mm. Follow me as I follow Christ. Um, of all people, of all people, Mark Wise one time encouraged me. Mark Wise, he said, Pastor Eric, I appreciate you giving the kingdom of way. Boy, do I want to. Boy, do I want to. But I'm not giving anything away in this church because it ain't mine. But if it's leased out to you, you're going to have the same approach we have about it. If we're going to share that stage or this stage, we're going to share the same conviction. Amen. We're not going to love and hear and fight out there. As for me in this house, we're going to serve the Lord. We might drop the ball, but we won't come back to the huddle blaming you. We're going to be quick to say, my fault, and I apologize. Look at me. Apologizing is not repenting. Apologizing to people and repenting to God is the key to growing relationally. If you're not saying you're sorry often, you're walking in pride. And if you're married and you're not saying it, you ain't going to be married long. Sorry about that, you know, half-heartedly. No, 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 no. You're going to say it genuinely or you won't, they won't be any honey in that money. Right. <laughs> Is it okay to fumble the ball? Yes. That's okay. Isn't that okay? But if you fumble the ball six times in one quarter, we're going to look at your gloves. Does that make sense? If you take the ball and you throw it down, that's not a fumble. That's saying, hey, I, I don't matter to me. It's going to be my way or the highway. That's, that's wrong. Amen? Let me ask you this. Is it wrong to drop the ball if somebody's throwing it to you from time to time? I sure hope so. Because there's, there's this little thing called family, and if you're going to be in family, you're going to have mistakes. People are going to mess up. They're going to do stuff you think they're absolutely having a mental breakdown. You're going to say things like, what is wrong with you? Hello? And when somebody's hurting, both teams stop to make sure that person is not going through stuff. Oh, hallelujah, Bridget Sanchez. Oh, hallelujah that we're in a church right now that when you don't show up or you're sick, somebody's checking in on you. And if they don't, we didn't know. Look this way. No one is Jesus. No one can read your mind. No one. No one. I believe that this church and you as an individual, you are a quarter of an inch from the goal line. Let me confess to you right now my biggest weakness. Green 25! Bologna sandwich! Bologna sandwich! Green 22. All we've got to do, come on somebody, come on. is get a quarter of an inch. <laughs> we just got to get a quarter of an inch. Y'all know what we're going to do? We ain't passing it. Help me preach, y'all. We're going to get the prayer, hold the mic out. We're going to get the prayer warriors around the ball. Y'all ready? And the quarterback's going to go to the line. And brother, he's going to get somebody who's prayed up. To get right beside him. You ever seen these new Christians? Give me the ball. At church early, leaving church late. Salivating like a puppy wanting to help God. I'll do anything for you, God. You deliver my soul. I'll jump off a bridge if you tell me to. They'll do anything for God. We're at the line of scrimmage, folks. 
Creative Church, we got a quarter of an inch left in this summer. And here was where God's taken us to. Open miracles. Thank you for that. I'll take one more amen. amen. Open miracles. Divine transactions where people just, man, you won't believe what happened. Oh, I'll believe it. Because when you honor the community of the corporate body, something happens on you individually. See, I, let me tell you, I don't often, I, I don't all the time come to Creative Church prayed up and ready to run the ball, but I draw strength from people who are in this game with me. And if they're not quitting, I'm not quitting. So here's what we're going to do. Y'all ready? We're going to put the ball under the center. He's going to begin to snap it. But before he does, we're going to back up as a team. You know what we're going to do? Can anybody guess? And we're going to say, give me the ball. And as soon as he snaps the ball, he's going to turn, isn't he? He's going to turn, right? And he's going to hand you, somebody, the ball. And we're going to take the ball. Anybody know what we're going to do? And we're going to run it with a smile on our face. We're going to go. We're going to leap. Over this line and that line. We're going to stick the ball out. You ever seen them do it? Yeah. They run and they hit the line and they just jump. They know they could be injured. But the goal of the entire team is number one. And they take that ball and they leap. Risking life and limb. And the moment, come on, the nose of that ball touches that white line, they're in. They're in. Can I tell you, with, with God, you don't need an instant replay. With God, you need one play. You, I need just one play, one thing. You know what teams do that are not well coached? They give it to the most talented person and say, Run. That's not dumb. But a real team can win as a team. Amen. Teams beat superstars any day. Right. You know why? Because one team's trying to find balance. That's that, that team that's a team's got order. They're like bugs, man. They're like ants marching. Whew. Kip. Is that right? Kip? Are you Philip's brother? Philip's better looking brother. That's what you're supposed to say, right? I, I'm, the, I'm the better looking brother. This is Philip's brother. He's been here a couple weeks, months now. Folks, I'm glad new people are coming to this church. Uh, Kip, you, uh, you have a towing service? Is that what you do? In life, you're going to get broke down. Come on. You're going to need people to pull you along. You ever spiritually lived off somebody else's faith? In a traditional church, you wouldn't leave because your grandma would kill you. Right. Amen. <laughs> Y'all going over there to that hip skip church, I tell you what, they don't know how to bake, bake, uh, put grease in a pan. You just did what your grandma did. At some point, you got to fight your own devil. Miss Doreen right here has a brother. What is he, 50? Or is it, what's his name? How old is he? Um, what's his name? Robert. He's in his early 60s. He has had a leg removed. He's at the Ridgeland Nursing Home. She's there every week visiting that brother. And Miss Joy Fender is there. That's a part of her ministry. Some of you don't even know her. Come on. Come on. There's, there's things happening. Did you know, Courtney, stand up. St Courtney, Courtney, stand up, Courtney. Stand up. Me? Courtney, stand up. Look at that pretty woman right there. Look at, look at me. Did you know? Thank you, Courtney. Sit down. Did you know that that's one of the strongest financial givers in this body? One of the strongest. Loves God so much, she tithes and gives offerings. How do you know, Pastor Eric? Because once a year I pull the report to see where the money's coming from. Amen. Who's giving? I also see who's not. Amen. You're tipping. 
But boy, if we win the game, come on. <laughs> Amen. How many of you feel spiritually like we're about a quarter inch from a breakthrough? <laughs> Individually and as a church. Stand with me. Come on, stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I do believe there are people here that are not right with you and need to get right. I believe whether they have been saved one time or they have been restored a million times, that your grace is sufficient. Now, I believe, Lord, that there are people here who have just heard this simple message and, 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 and need forgiveness over some things they know about or even don't know about. I thank you right now, God, for every person that makes this body what it is. That we are not in competition with others. That this is a loving bride, a caring bride, a giving body. Lord, we're right where you want us to be. So far from where we will be in time, hallelujah, but so close to where you want us to be right now. Lord, today we're going to go over to the ocean and baptize people, whether it's five or twenty. We praise you, God, for the privilege of being public with our faith. Father, thank you for a room full of people that are here now and an untold amount of angels present that we cannot see. Father, I thank you that people will be genuinely born, genuinely born again in this service. So if you're here today and you would say, Pastor Eric, listen, I heard the little football message here and, and I, I, there are some things I need to make right in my life. For the first time or for the 10,000th time, I just want you to slip your hand up. I see that hand. I see that hand. Wow, I see that hand. I see those hands. Let's pray this prayer together. Father God, in Jesus' name, forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. I know the way. And I'm thankful for your grace. I have been a sinner, but wash me in your blood and I'll be saved. Thank you for this salvation, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. Here's my altar call. I want representatives of people who feel like in this life you're getting in position for something in God. Pastor, this was a message for me. Come on, I release you. I, I feel like I'm an inch from something great. Come on, come on, I just want to pray with you briefly. I feel like God's called me to leadership in life. You're in real estate, you're in banking, you're in construction, you're in whatever, and you're, you're an inch from something good, something great. But you can't get the ball over the line. Pastor Eric, I've been praying about my family and I feel like I'm an inch from somebody getting saved. You probably are. Amen. You probably are. Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for those that respond to this call today. Thank you for Naisha today, God. Father, I praise you. Stretch hands toward these people, congregation. Stretch your hand. Father God, I thank you for Naisha. I thank you, God, that you're calling her higher to a great place in you. I just pray for great purpose and grace to overtake her and overshadow her. Equip her. Give her wisdom beyond her years. God, make the hard things easy and, 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 and move, the, move the mountain, Lord, if that's what she's desiring. Meet every need she has. Thank you for Julia, God, and placement and, and purpose. I declare over them as a family, as a gr group, as a couple. God, I thank you for this soon coming child, Lord, and what they do in Brandon and those they fostered before. Lord, I just lay hands on them and, and anoint them with uh, a, a peace about things and a gladness and a, a newfound joy in their heart. That they, they're not out out of place Holy Spirit they're in place that 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 you're moving it like chess pieces Lord and you will show them the way to take thank you for Courtney God and Nick and their family her mother her grandmother and Joshua thank you Lord that she's serving you in full faith giving you all that she has spiritually and physically Lord I thank you for Doreen bless her today encourage her God Lord she matters I hear the Holy Spirit saying tell her that she means so much and matters so much that there's people, there are people who are watching you that don't, you don't even know are watching you. Be encouraged in the Lord today. Your life doesn't just matter, it matters greatly. And I bless you today in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for Bridget, for strength and purpose. You have a purpose, you have a purpose, you have a purpose. The Holy Spirit says, be careful who you tell everything to. Be wise with your words. Walk discreetly and with discernment. God's using you. 
Begin, no longer pray for your husband like, Lord, please, you know, like a beggar's plea. Begin to thank God yes. for saving your husband. Yes. God, I thank you that you are saving my whole family. Yes. You're going to begin to see this come to pass. God, I thank you for Melissa. Lord, help her to release all to you, to give all to you, to not worry, fret, or be filled with anxiety over what she can't control, to serve you and to give you her whole heart. I believe, the, I believe your inches, maybe, maybe less, inches from a great breakthrough in your life. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Even the recent struggles you have had with um, just exhaustion and the, the taxing it is to raise kids and watch kids that are all you know, under knee high. God's given you newfound strength as a mother, newfound strength as a wife. And He's blessing you. There's so much more in you than where you are. But that's not a sin because you're not there. You're headed in that direction. Uh, you're growing. You do not sense that you're growing. I don't really feel myself growing in God. But you are growing, says the Lord. You're growing in the Lord. Hold this for me. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for Mark and Linda Wise. I pray God for all things uh, to come into place for them.